I'd like to introduce our next keynote pre presentation here at the Planet Microcap Showcase Vancouver. Uh, we've done a number of podcasts over the years and uh, always, always love to hear his insights and what he has to say regarding the markets, especially our small microcap universe here. So next up, we got Dave Barr from Pender Fund. Dave, take it away. Thanks, Bobby. Um, and thank you for hosting this great event. Um, I know there's a lot of investors and CEOs of microcap companies here today, and nobody usually cares about these companies. There's it's not a lot of interest out there. So it's, it's nice to get all of us in one room together and uh, share our best ideas. So thanks, uh, Bobby, for bringing the show up to, to Vancouver. Um, today, I'm going to kind of have some high-level overviews of my approach to microcap investing. Um, and then just walk through some really interesting data points that I think tells us we're all hunting in the right, uh, in the right uh, field. So at Pender, who are we? Uh, we're just a bunch of, and Sharon always gets mad at me when I say this, I got to remember this is recorded, um, but we're like the Island of Misfit Toys from that Rudolph Claymation Christmas special. Um, we all look at the world a little bit differently. We always we have our idiosyncratic ways of trying to identify which businesses we really want to be invested in the long term. And at the end of the day, we just we get up every day. We love figuring out the unit economics of businesses and how long they're going to grow for. Um, because at the bottom, end of the day, we love making money on these companies. The with our funds, you know, it's it's so important to be aligned. So we invest uh, alongside all our clients in our funds. Um, we love microcap because it's such an inefficient part of the market. And, you know, at the end of the day, we, we try to be nimble and opportunistic, like being flexible enough to, to move in parts of the market that a lot of others can't. And I think, you know, I've, I've said this on the podcast with Bobby, if, if you're an individual investor running your personal account, you actually have a huge advantage over a lot of professionals out there because you can, you can buy these micro caps that are fairly illiquid for a, you know, a billion dollar fund manager. Um, and then when the stock, goes through the moon because every now and again, microcap stocks just uh, go parabolic. You can actually sell your position. Um, the billion dollar fund manager has to wait for the company to get sold or for the company to get to, you know, a 10 or $20 billion market cap. So what are we looking for? We're looking for hunter baggers. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, is this actually possible? And there's a great book published in the early seventies. It's now come to uh, it's a bit more popular today. And Chris Mayer wrote a, uh, an update to this, but it's called 100 to 1 in the Stock Market. It was written by Thomas Phelps. And he looked at all stocks between 1932 and 1971. And there's over 365 stocks. He identified over that period that returned 100 times your investment. So there's 365 opportunities to make 100 times your money in that time frame. Um, and the great news is there was one every year. Like every year you could have found one of these companies that was going to go up over a hundred times. And when we look at the world today, you know, markets are way more efficient today, apparently. Um, is it possible? And yes, it is. I mean, you look at a company like Constellation Software. Uh, we don't own Constellation Software, but it's up 167 times from its IPO price. Um, that, that'd be okay. Um, another company, Blackline Safety. We do own, own this in our portfolios. Um, it's up about 20 times from where it where it initially IPO'd. So there's a lot of opportunities here. Um, you know, Constellation clearly has gone up over 100x. There's a lot of companies that are still early in that compounding process that we can identify today. What do you need to get these types of returns? Uh, just two things. You need the business value to continually increase, and you need the multiple to expand. It's pretty simple. I mean, I just I love math. If earnings increases 25 times over however many years and the multiple goes up four times, you got your 100x. Um, and, but how do you, where, where do you look for these types of opportunities? And, you know, you have to look for companies, you know, where, where are the multiples compressing and where are the unit economics strong and, and probably misidentified. So looking for smaller companies is clearly a good place to be because you don't have, you know, the, all the Harvard MBAs and the Bain guys and all those guys down in Wall Street combing through all the financials and doing 100 customer calls um, that, you're, that you're actually competing against. You, finding companies smaller where you actually understand the product or the service, where you can find if it's actually differentiated. 
And then when you're looking at smaller companies, you can find companies that are really early in the compounding process. I mean, I know a lot of the companies that are presented here uh, today and are going to present, you know, a lot of these companies are very, er they're, they're in the very early innings of, you know, really long runways where they're going to be able to, you know, they're probably 5% market saturation today. Um, so there's 95%, 95 times growth potential here in the next, uh, in the next 10 or 20 years for these companies. Um, one thing we always look for is uh, a proven long-term focus management team. And, you know, this is, this is a pretty tricky uh, part of small cap investing as most investors here can probably attest to. Um, you want the management team really focusing on the long term, and it, it can be really challenging because if you have a good quarter, your stock goes up. And people like their stocks going up because then their stock options are worth more. Um, but at the end of the day, you really want to find that alignment and that long-term thinking um, where the, the founders, the CEOs, and the management teams are really trying to drive value, not next quarter, but where the company is going to be five and 10 years from today. You know, when we, when we read the book, 100 to 1 in the Stock Market, um, there, was, there was two general areas of companies that actually returned 100 to 1. Um, one's restructurings. And if you look at kind of the market today with the, the move we've had in interest rates, the increase in bankruptcies, um, I think what we're probably going to see is a lot of restructuring opportunities. And so if you look at some of these, you know, uh, in kind of over time, companies that had overlevered balance sheets and then had to re, you know, basically recapitalize the business by converting the debt to equity, um, it's pretty cool. You can buy debt at 10 cents on the dollar. And then you can equitize it at 100 cents on the dollar at a depressed multiple. And then you own a whole bunch of a really good company that's now debt free. And um, now, you know, spitting out a, free, a ton of free cash flow and a going concern. Um, the other area you find a lot of these opportunities is in the micro cap space. So just companies that were totally unfollowed um, 10, 20, 30, $50 million market cap businesses. When you kind of look at general market dynamics and where can you find these businesses, things that are too hard, um, micro cap companies that are really compli complicated. Um, it's hard for people to get their heads around. So they're just going to move on to something easier to do. Um, I hate to say it, but people are lazy. Um, looking for general market downturns. So, you know, when, when everybody's selling, you know, that's usually a good time to get invested. Uh, I remember March 2020, um, everybody here was like backing up the truck, right? Okay. Neither were we. Um, but it was a, like, when, if what, your portfolio from March 2020 over the next 12 months, I, mean, I think we were up over 100% over that period of time. And so just being able to deploy capital in those periods of time is, is, a, is a huge advantage in finding these types of companies. And then more specifically, we do see industry downturns. Uh, specifically, what we're where, where we operate, we do a lot of small cap, micro cap tech. Uh, people just hate that right now. So, if you're looking for an industry downturn right now, micro cap tech is a great place to be. I apologize to the CEOs who probably don't feel it's a great place to be, um, but as an investor, you're there's an opportunity to get these companies at very attractive valuations today. What do you need to do be as an investor now? Um, you need to be a contrarian. I like this poor stormtrooper here. The you have to have a long-term outlook. So you need to be able to kind of navigate through the noise because when you're a contrarian, um, companies are going to release good results and then the stock's going to go down and it's going to, you're going to start questioning yourself. Um, so you, but you have to have that long-term outlook while being a contrarian so you can navigate and hold through the noise. The, the next part is, you know, it, it's, you, you need to get the multiple expansion contraction correct, but you need to get the economics of the business. And one thing that is crucial is if the earnings of the company are increasing, continue to hold. Um, if, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the data that came out 100 to, 100 to 1 in the stock market just really reinforced that the companies, as long as the earnings were continuing to increase, it was a really good idea to, to hold the stock. Because what ends up happening is a lot of these companies start looking expensive and you think you've got a better idea and you're going to sell it. And I still am upset at myself for selling Constellation software at $80. Nobody look at the stock chart today. Um, but at the same time, you can't just hold your position blindly. You always have to test your thesis. 
understand what the key business drivers are, why you think this company is going to continue to create economic value, and then try and figure out why they're not doing that anymore. Um, so it's very much like the scientific method where you're always testing your thesis, trying to prove yourself wrong. Uh, our small cap investment process, um, you know, it's driven by our background. We started in the venture world in, uh, I started in 2000, Pender started in the venture world in 2003. And it's really driven by understanding the quality of the business, uh, getting more value than we're paying for, um, being flexible and watching for the downside. And how this has evolved, it's into our private equity approach to public markets. So this is understanding, you know, do the deep work on the business, but have a value-based strategy. You, you got to pay the right price when you actually enter these. And that really uh, speaks to buying companies when multiples have contracted. So first part, what is a private equity approach? Well, the first part is your scuttlebutt research and due diligence. Um, a lot of people might recognize this individual. Uh, he wrote a great book called Common Common Stocks, Uncommon Profits, um, named Phil Fisher. And highly recommend this book to anybody who is, you know, looking to invest in small cap companies. And it was really interesting because I was, you know, running, running, a, working for a venture fund. And I started looking at public companies. And uh, it, was, it was a fascinating time in the mid 2000s where all these tech companies had gone public in 99, 2000. Um, not dissimilar to 2020 or 2020, 2021. And then they all got totally stranded. Um, nobody cared about these companies. Um, a couple of people in this room, I can see who, you know, we were looking at the same stranded companies, Brent. And, but it was, what, was, what was really interesting is like, I started looking at these companies and doing work on them and digging in. And I was like, wow, like these are great businesses. And about the same time I read Fisher's book and it was, what was fascinating was, he was doing this, like he was basically a venture capital operating in the public markets. Like he had it run, ran a 10 stock portfolio. He was doing customer calls. He was trying to talk to everybody he could at the company. He was showing up at their, the company's front door, trying to interview management teams. Um, so really taking that analytical approach, but applying it in the public markets. Um, the second part of private equity is you work with the company to help them realize value. You want the company to grow. Um, you know, multiple expansion is great, but it's a, it's, you know, it's a, it's a one hit drug. You really need the business economics to, to drive the long-term returns for you. And, you know, as investors, we, we like to engage with management teams. We like to talk to boards and directors, um, offer insight into how, you know, we, we think things can be done a little bit better. Um, I mean, we're probably talking 2% increments. We can't claim to know more about a business than the CEO, but sometimes we can, uh, we can help out a little bit. Uh, the third aspect is, uh, you know, in the private world, uh, you know, when you make an investment in a company, you generally get liquid by selling your comp the, the company outright at the end of the day. And, you know, what we've seen in the public markets, particularly in Canada, a lot of these small cap companies are, by, are bought by bigger companies, um, either private equity or strategics. And understanding who the buyers of a company are, are, are potentially before you get invested um, and understanding industry dy dynamics. You know, you, there's certain industries where there's a lot of M&A activity. You've got a couple very, you know, big PE sponsors who are aggressively funding roll-ups. Uh, you've probably got a much higher probability of getting uh, liquid or taken out in your small cap company um, in situations like that. Of course, it's not always a great thing. Uh, you know, the usually... Companies like to buy other like to buy great companies. They don't like to buy bad companies. So they usually don't bail you out of your mistakes, but they do short circuit the compounding process in your winners. And an example for us, a company we we bought last summer was uh, Magnet Forensics, and got uh, you know bought it really opportunistically in the summertime at about eighteen dollars, and then you know through the fall it started running up, and then. Uh, private equity firm agrees to buy them at I think it was forty three dollars about eight months later. And like, that was great. It was like, oh, you know, bought it at 18 companies getting taken out of 43. We, you should be happy. Right. And the reality was no, like magnet forensics was growing at over 40% growth rate was accelerating. Like it was probably the best software company in Canada. Um, and now it's a public company or private company and we can't own it anymore. Uh, value-based strategy, again, just, Focusing on the price you pay, it does matter. 
but I do want to share some interesting data points. So um, George Baker, uh, great quote on uh, buying and holding compounders. To make money in stocks, you must have the vision to see them, the courage to buy them, and then the patience to hold them. And all three of those skills are very different. And you need to have all three to experience um, hunter baggers in your, in your pro in personal portfolios. This is uh, a great study done by, I think it was uh, Black Star Funds, and they analyzed 9,000 stocks that went through the Russell 3000. So basically the entire investable U.S. universe, I think it was from the early 80s to about 20, 27 or 2007, 2008. Um, but what this shows is, you know, the top 25% of performing stocks drove all the returns in the market. The bottom 75% um, was, was a collective zero. So you really want to focus on the top performing stocks uh, in the indices in order to generate stronger returns. And this is just the data shown a, a different way. Um, I like to I, I like this graph because you know what it shows is you know about 40% of stocks you would lose money on or 20% go to zero. Um, so this is the same study shown a little differently, but here 20% 20, 20 of stocks you're going to lose all your money on. Like that, that's pretty scary. 40% you will lose money on. Um, if you look at the far right of this chart, this is the 20% of stocks that return greater than 300% on average. And so this is really where you want to be hunting for to identify those great long-term returns. Um, conversely, on your risk mitigation side, you want to avoid the stuff on the left. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of common themes on that side. It's, you know, over-levered balance sheets, um, exploration companies, zero revenue, um, you know, 100 million of uh, negative uh, retained earnings, um, lots of indicators you can see to, uh, to avoid those types of companies. Um, next data point uh, is looking at the S&P 500 and the curse of size. And if you look at the, like the, the, the largest 10, 10 stocks in the S&P 500, between 72 and 2016, $1 became $66. Uh, sorry, if you look at all of them, on the S&P 500, um, $1 became $66. At the same time, the, the, the largest companies, your $1 became $5. So, you know, maybe it's different this time with Apple and Google and Microsoft. Um, those are usually pretty dangerous words in finance. Uh, but if you focus outside the largest companies, it's generally where you're going to find a higher probability of outsized returns. And then everybody loves a good Ben Graham quote, um, but I want to talk about one of his dirty little secrets. And he actually, you know, he talks a lot. If you read The Intelligent Investor, it's like, this, you know, buying everything at discount to book value and then selling, and it's a really high transaction portfolio. Uh, but he made one decision that basically dwarfed every single little decision he ever made. And this is in the postscript uh, in the 1972 edition of The Intelligent Investor. Um, where, ironically enough, the aggregate of profits accruing from GEICO far exceeded the sum of all others realized through 20 years of all their operations of investing. Um, so they did all this work and all this other stuff, and they bought GEICO. And here's what it looked like. So, you know, GEICO was $1 invested, became $600 from 48 to 72. Um, S&P 500, Graham Newman Partnership, S&P 500 over the same time as GEICO, um, returns were, were were very meager compared to Geico. So um, Ben Graham, the father of value investing, uh, everyone, you know, as soon as they graduate from finance class, decides they're going to be a Ben Graham investor and um, just just go find one stock. Sorry, that's not career advice. I, I'll put that disclaimer out there. Um, what's interesting is if you look at what he did, like where did Ben Graham stay consistent with his approach to Geico and where did he break his own rules? Well, he stayed consistent by focusing on value. He bought it when it was cheap. And he also bought a small cap stock. Those were two things that uh, Graham was uh, a big proponent of. Where he, where he broke, broke his own rules was he made a concentrated bet. Um, he put a lot of capital into this one investment. And then on the other side, he was extremely patient. He didn't exercise his own sell discipline. So again, going back to kind of the three characteristics or the, the, the Baker quote where it's like, you got to be a contrarian. So you got to buy things when they're cheap and people don't like them. But then you have to be you have to be, uh, you have to be concentrated and you have to be patient. And then you know I love this quote because it just puts things in perspective. Jay Paul Getty's his formula for success: 
Rise early, work hard, strike oil. Um, this is all probabilistic. Luck is a wonderful thing. Thank you, everybody. And any questions? Yeah. So when we look at uh, when we look at an investment, we categorize it into one of two camps. Uh, it's either a compounder, so it has the ability to you know go for a long period of time, or it's a close the discount situation. You know, the reality is we we love having compounders in the por our portfolio. It's hard to find 30. Um, there's just are you going to find 30 stocks at a reasonable price that you want to hold on to for 20 years? Probably not. But so our sell discipline on compounders is our, our target weightings are between two and 5%. Um, if it gets to fair value, we will take our position sizing down. The only time we will look to actively sell a compounder now is when it exceeds our blue sky scenario. So when we run our, we, we run a bunch of different scenarios. Um, generally it's a bull case, a base case and a bear case. In the case of a compounder, we'll have a blue sky scenario where it's like, we, you know, we sit around, we have a beer, we say, if everything goes right, like how high could this actually go? That, and if the stock actually gets there, that's when we sell. Um, that's my, our highly technical approach, but that's, that's how we come up with our, our final sell discipline for a compounder. Because the reality is it's, it's, it's hard to buy them back. Um, so if you sell out completely, um, it's hard to go. On the close the discount story, this is where you know, we'd see the unit economics of the business growing, you know, single digits, you know, you're not going to get a 15% just from the business. And in those situations, that's where, when it gets to our bull case scenario, we'll look to uh, exit the company completely. I think, you know, if we kind of go back to this chart here, kind of in the middle, this is the close the discount situations. And those are, those are good businesses and you can make money if you buy them really cheap and then you sell them. You tend to round trip on those if you hold them too long. So you need to be nimble and, and move around on those. Um, whereas on the far right, these are the compounders. These are the truly great businesses where um, we try not to sell those unless things get goofy. And some things did get goofy in February 2021. So what we would say is who is, who is the goofy last buyer who's going to pay the highest possible price for this company at a point in time where they're hitting on all cylinders? So, you know, you know, like NVIDIA right now, like how much would somebody pay to buy that company outright today? Um, Cause that's a company that's everything's going incredibly well right now. Um, who is, who is the least sophisticated buyer who's going to pay the highest price for that? That would be our blue sky scenario on NVIDIA today. You, you have to understand them. There's, you have to understand market dynamics and pro cyclical behavior. So yes, gut feel like it's, you know, when, when things start going really well, people always get up, like they get overly optimistic, they pay too much. Um, but what does that end state look like? Um, and that's, there's definitely some gut feel there. And it's different for every company. Like you've got a software company that's got 90% free cash or gross margins, 40% um, free cash flow margins growing at 40%. You know, someone's going to pay way more than that for that than they are. Um, an industrial company that needs to make widgets and carry inventory and just way less capital efficient. Yeah. So question is about pessimism in the micro cap space. And I think we've, we've seen two trends over the past 10 to 20 years that have really hollowed out the traditional micro cap and small cap investment community. I, mean, I, I got a note from uh, an, 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 uh, a client of ours and He's like, you're one of the last people standing for Canadian fund managers that doesn't do resources. Um, like there's, there's none of us left. And it's like, well, where, where is the capital gone? So if you think about the institutional space, um, a lot, you know, uh, Dave Swenson at Yale, um, you know, popular, popularized the, the Yale model. And, you know, if you look at the Yale endowment now, it's about 40% invested in private equity. And so what a lot, of, a lot of the large institutional investors have done is they've taken their risk bucket um, where they're looking for risk and they've moved it from small cap into private equity because you can generate 18% low vol returns forever. It's a wonderful thing in a declining interest rate environment. So we've lost that in, we've lost that institutional following in small cap. Um, similarly, I mean, in, in Canada, the structure of the industry has changed dramatically. Like individual investors, um, there's a lot of move towards ETFs and passive investing. Um, and we've, you know, like, why wouldn't you do that? I mean, you should, I mean, the last five years, you should have bought a NASDAQ 100 ETF and not paid any fees. And I mean, so you should do that for the next five years too, right? Like it's, so that trend, that trend continues. 
as well as the structure of the investment industry in Canada, the you know, like a lot of the wealth has moved towards the large uh, the large banks in Canada, and the the advisor books are just getting so big that they can't actually come down and do small cap investing on their own. So um, it, there's just there's been a hollowing out of the small cap investment community. How does that change? I mean, picking inflection points is uh, uh, you know, it's very rewarding when you do it, and um, but the probability of success is low. And you know, my, you know, what I think is probably going to happen is we are going to see at some point in the next 24 months uh, a reversal where small caps are outperforming large caps, and then once you get a one year of returns of outperformance of uh, small caps to large caps, that's when people are going to start saying, well, oh, hey, my neighbor just made all this money. They sold their S&P 500 ETF and they bought a small cap fund and they're doing well. So I think that's, you know, it's that pro-cyclical behavior on the other side um, that I think we're probably really close to seeing. Um, I mean, if you, if you look at the markets today, small caps are trading at like the valuations today are akin to March 2020, uh, March 2009 and early 2002, 2003. Um, and I think this is really, you know, for periods of time, this really maps well with the early 2000s because you have had this like massive rally and a whole bunch of mega cap stocks, which drove the market, big sell off, and then small caps emerged out of it. So like, I just, I get really excited about what our five and 10 year number is going to be five and 10 years from now. And the next speaker is great. And for full disclosure, Dave Barr is not a shareholder of NVIDIA.